Welcome to the only wrestling podcast that covers the WWE developmental system from its inception to modern day. From OVW to MCW to HWA, Deep South, FCW, and much more. Hosted by Brian Asbury and Mortimer Blankenship. Now let's dive into what could have been, what should have been. Welcome to Developmentally Speaking. Hey, before we get in this episode, can you do us a favor? Will you go ahead and subscribe to the channel? We you ring that notification bell? And if you would, give this video a like. Well, enough of that mumbo jumbo. Let's get to the episode. Let's talk developmentally speaking, glow up, and connecting through wrestling. Hey everybody, I'm Morty. And I'm Brian. And on today's episode of Developmentally Speaking, we have... You may know him as Jacob Duncan or Triton in TNA. Yeah. Ryan, how's it going? Nice to see you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you guys for having me, man. I'm doing good, man. Just, uh, like I said, I'm getting ready to watch my little 10-year-old boy have football practice here. And, you know, uh, can't beat it, can you? days, I've been... I'm sorry? You can't beat that, can you? This is a good times, man. I'm sure here in three or four years, Dad will not be cool. So, you know, <laughs> when it hits the 13 or 14, Dad will not be cool. So right now, I'm soaking it in, brother. Right on. So, um, but doing good, man. Fantastic. Well, I'll ask you the same question I ask everybody that comes on to this podcast. Um, what made you want to get into professional wrestling? Well, I actually fell into professional wrestling. I played basketball in college at East Tennessee State University. <clears throat> and then I played in Argentina for a short period of time and uh, blew my ankle out over there and um, had reconstructive ankle surgery. So... I uh, moved to Nashville. I still have the 615 number, as you can tell. Um, yeah, I moved to Nashville. I was managing a chain of like five goals gyms. Um, the reconstructive ankle surgery was basically a year process. I was in the cast for 16 weeks, walking boot for 15, 16 more weeks. So all I could do at that point was really work out and lift. So. You know, lifted, got bigger, stronger. At the time, TNA was taken off in Nashville. So I had always been a wrestling fan, you know, in college, the Money Not Wars, things like that. Me and my brother, we used to wrestle in the backyard. We made belts, things like that. Um, you know, but when I was in Nashville, TNA was just starting up. Some of the guys would come to the gym and, and uh, work out, things like that. So I just started training with them and taking some bumps in the ring and, you know, one thing kind of led to another, and uh, I guess because of my size at the time and being at that time fairly young and still athletic, I kind of fell into the business because of my size and athleticism. Um, but it actually started in Nashville uh, with TNA when TNA was first launching and doing their shows at uh, the Nashville uh, Fairgrounds. Okay. So how, how was it, you know, starting your career off there as to where they were just starting building and then being around... Because they had a lot of uh, a lot of people at that time that used to be on, on national television on a regular basis. And then, like, what was man, it like? Growing up, I, uh, I loved it, man. I, I was new to the business. I was excited to get in the ring and take bumps. New guys, old guys. I remember, you know, I mean, the hell they brought in, you know, obviously Jeff Jarrett, but the hell they brought in Dusty Rhodes. You know, uh, at that time, Nikita Koloff, Rowdy Roddy Piper, um, the Road Warriors. Raven, I mean, all these guys that I'd seen and watched growing up in wrestling, you know, uh, Kurt Henning, and so I was just in love with the business, you know, and I just tried to talk to those guys and soak up as much as I could, you know. Looking back on it now, the one thing I regret, because I was always pretty much business and serious, and don't get me wrong, I had a lot of fun, but I wish I had, would have let my guard down a little bit more and had a lot more fun with the wrestling business and not taking it so seriously. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, they had brought in X-Pac. I mean, they, you know, na numerous names, man. They had, they brought in, you know, just starting off to get some recognition, some name recognition, things like that. Guys I grew up watching. And, um, you know, I wish I would just have let my guard down a little bit more and soaked that all in, you know, and enjoyed it more. But I was always kind of laser focused and, of business and trying to you know hit my stride so to speak but um that's the one thing i regret tna wwe obw the whole nine if i would just let my guard down a bit more and soak it in a little bit more and had more fun 
you know, while I was there. Like I said, I had fun, but I wish I would have let my garden element more and soaked it all in and just, you know, enjoyed the process a little bit more. Now being, you know, I'll be 45 on Monday. So, you know, now that I'm 45 years old, I wish I would have soaked a little bit more of it in. Well, happy birthday on Monday. That's actually, uh, so this video will be dropping on your birthday. So that's happy birthday. Yeah, there you go. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it has to be, I, I know from my personal experience of being in wrestling, you know, being surrounded by your heroes, you know, grow, you know, people growing up, people that you watched. Um, can, do you remember any certain advice from any of those people that, that you, you just kept with you through your wrestling career? Oh, man, I, 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 you know, fortunately, man, I had so many people that were good to me. I remember Road Warrior Hawk when I was in TNA. Uh, Kurt Henning when I was with TNA and then um, when I was with WWE obviously The Undertaker was kind of my main mentor I looked up to him and he was kind of always a childhood hero um, I still text him periodically and he's just um, he's just he's a really good man um, he's been through a lot seen a lot and um, you know I've met very few people in my career and in my life that when they walk into a room, they just have a presence about them. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say your undertaker is probably that guy. When he walks into a room, he kind of owns the room, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, he gave me a lot of lot of good advice on a personal level, you know, and a professional level. You know, uh, when I first got WWE, because I was always used to being athletic and stuff like that. And the biggest thing he told me, he was like, Ryan, he's like, you're a big dude, but he's like, some of your actions make you look small. Because I was always used to kind of being in, in that athletic stance and being, you know, I never, you know, when you're playing basketball and stuff, you try to be in athletic stance, things like that. You never really stand up tall just to be considered a giant. You know, but that was one of the first things he told me the first week or two I was there. He's like, man, some, some of your actions make you look small. He's like, you got to take advantage of your size. So that was probably one thing that stuck out to me that Taker told me, um, you know, but he's probably the biggest mentor, you know, as far as, especially my WWE days. It, I got to the point if Taker was on the road and Ryan was on the road, you know, and I was kind of learning from him. And, um, you know, I take away a lot, honestly, a lot of the more personal advice he gave me in life, as well as um, the professional wrestling advice. I think he's just a... Uh, He's a, he's a really, really, really good dude. And like I said, he's one of the few people I've met in my life that when he walks into a room, he definitely has a presence about him. So, Absolutely. So how, what, what was the original, starting with TNA, and then we'll go on to, to OVW, what, was there a plan for you in TNA? What, I mean, what would they obviously with your size? What? I think TNA was just kind of... Uh, you know, you know, I think Jeff Jarrett and, you know, they were, again, they were trying to get the company off the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, Wildcat, Wildcat, Chris Harris, James Storm, there was some of the local guys that, you know, kind of hit the stride and hit it, got, it, got it going big with the American Social Award and things like that. Um, Abyss obviously came in, kind of an unknown name. Obviously, AJ Styles, everybody knows AJ now. And, um, you know, I was just a... Obviously, a young green green kid trying to get a name, and uh, started with the Red Search Security, and uh, you know just trying to get some uh, on screen time, and then I actually got a, a a opportunity to go to Puerto Rico for a few months. So Dutch Mantel, and uh, we kind of did a storyline where I broke my arm against Sandman, and things like that, and uh, so that way I could go to uh, Puerto Rico for a few months. So the Red Search Security thing was kind of short lived. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I went to Puerto Rico, came back, and at that time, you know, TNA had moved to doing their tapings in Orlando, Florida at Universal Studios. So, uh, you know, that's kind of when the Triton character, you know, came came about. So, any uh, fond memories from from TNA? I know we've touched on it a little bit, but. Um favorite matches I mean, or, or you know, I've got a lot of you know I've got a lot of good memories from TNA I wish I at the time I have you know I wish I had known more about the business yeah. so to speak yeah. as far as you know wanting to speak up and kind of give my ideas instead of just mm -hmm. being kind of a bobblehead and a yes 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 
you know, I think the Triton character could have done well. Um, one interesting story about that, when I was debuting the Triton character, um, I had no idea because somebody at Universal Studios kind of drew my logo that was on the back of my trunks and stuff like that. And Jerry Jarrett, you know, came to me and was like, man, you you got to wear all black trunks and you can't wear, your, you know, your long jacket tonight. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, the Ultimate Warrior is threatening to sue us because your logo looks too much like his. I was like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we had this big debut, and then I had to go out basically just black tights and stuff because of that. So, Man. you know, I, felt like, I kind of felt like Triton was hit from the get-go after that, you know. But uh, myself and Monty Brown, we made the most of it, you know what I mean? So, um and then my contract was coming up, and then um, I remember going to um, Cleveland and Pittsburgh and doing some tryout stuff for WWE. And uh, of course, Double A R and Anderson came up to me after the tryout. I was like, "Big man, you did good. You look good today." And blah blah blah. And I was like, "Okay, this is you know." So, <laughs> and that's kind of what led me to uh, going to you know get my contract there and going to OVW. Mm-hmm. So. Before we uh, move on to OVW, I uh, we actually I, we haven't talked to many people about wrestling down on the island. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, what, what was it like down there? <laughs> was it crazy? Like <laughs> uh, Puerto Rico is kind of crazy, man. I went to Puerto Rico right in the middle. I don't know if you're familiar with like the Three Kings Day holiday. Mm-hmm. But uh, Three Kings Day holiday is pretty much the last three weeks of the year. Everybody just, um, for lack of a better term, just parties, I guess you could say. <laughs> so my first night, me and uh, actually Chet the Jet, who was in OVW with me. Chet the Jet. We stayed in the same house, and uh, we walked to 7-Eleven, and this guy drives by. And I, I don't know if he had T-tops or sunroof or whatever, but it was like, da 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 you know, like an Uzi outside of his, um, you know, T-tops or whatever. And then uh, we were wrestling, I think, in Bayamon down there in front of like 25,000 people, 20, 25,000 people, when, you know, one of the big, bigger, huge basketball arenas. And uh, we had a riot. The oh, SWAT no. team came in. Yeah, SWAT team came in in SWAT gear, locked all the wrestlers in the locker room. Um, the fans were hitting each other with chairs, the whole nine yards. The guys who were in the main event were basically locked down in the steel cage. So, you know, it, it was Puerto Rico was an interesting place, man. Wow. <laughs> it definitely was an interesting place. So, yeah. Okay. So you get to Louisville, and uh, you get to OVW. And how, what was that initial experience like? <laughs> Um, I felt like I, I honestly, I mean, I felt like I needed it because I was just, you know, I was kind of thrown into the professional wrestling scene because TNA was just starting off. Um, I felt like I needed the actual training. I mean, I worked a bunch of indie matches and stuff like that, but as far as actual training, sitting back and talking psychology with Al Snow, you know, Robert Gibson, um, Dr. Death, Steve Williams came in, of course, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, those guys came in and just trying to learn, mm-hmm. you know, I remember, yeah, I remember the first time I went to, uh, I got called up to, I don't know if it was Raw or SmackDown, and we were working out before the show, and, um, you know, I was just, we, a bunch of guys were working out, and I'm in there with a guy about six feet tall, and here, I, you know, whatever, and, um, we're just calling a match, and I'm here. I, you know, I, I want to show my athleticism, so I'm like drop down, leapfrog, blah blah blah. And Taker comes out, and he's like, "Big man," he's like, "What the hell are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> he's like, "He's like, no, you, he's like, you don't ever drop down on a fucking leapfrog. Somebody six feet tall." He goes, "You kick their head off with a big boot." And I was like, "All right, man." So that was kind of me and Taker's, you know, first interaction. He was calling me out because you know I was working like somebody that was AJ Styles size, you know. What I mean? So. But, um, you know, I wanted to show my athleticism, of course, and try to catch somebody's eye. I caught somebody's eye, but it was obviously not in the in the right light, so to speak. So, um, you know, but the, so I felt like I needed OVW, man, and just the psychology of the wrestling. And, you know, and truly learning how to work like a big man, because if you remember back in the TNA days, 
other than Abyss, I don't think there was any other really true big monster guys, you know what I mean? So, and, um, you know, trust me, I, I, I wrestled Abyss a lot, Chris Harris a lot. We traveled the Emmys a lot. I wrestled Abyss in uh, Mid-South Coliseum, which is a kind of a historic arena, arena in Memphis. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, Jerry Lawler came back to us that night and shook both of our hands and said that was the best match of the night. So, you know. Um, it's good stuff. You know, I give Abyss and Chris Harris, you know, a hell of a lot of credit for starting me in my career, and they both helped me get a lot of bookings. I would say Chris Harris, James Storm, and Abyss helped me, you know, get tons of bookings in Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Indiana, Ohio, those areas, you know, when I had no name, you know. So, um, so yeah, those guys started off in Nashville and starting teeing off TNA days. You know, those guys, again, I can't say enough about those guys, about helping me get started. Um, so who came up with Jacob Duncan? Jacob Duncan, I would say, uh, well, I mean, the guys you know now would be like Dolph Ziggler, The Miz, Cody Rhodes, Beth Phoenix, uh, Maurice, uh, Kelly Kelly, CM Punk, um, Shad Gaspard, who, you know, got arrested so, mm -hmm. um, JTG, who was Shad's tag team partner, Brent Albright, um, you know, all the guys who were part of the Spirit Squad. I mean, I mentioned Nick Nimeth, but Mikey and Johnny Jr., all those guys who are part of the Spirit Squad. Maurice, Kelly Kelly, um, Beth Phoenix. I mean, we had a good crew in OVW, man. We really did. You know, we had a lot of fun, you know, traveling around Kentucky, Southern Indiana, and, um, you know, we did the best, you know, we could to help each other out, you know, as far as working out and things like that. Um, you know, not that I'm bragging or anything because she's a Hall of Famer, but I remember Beth Phoenix coming to me and, you know, me helping me, me helping her with like her diet, her workout routine and things like that. And, uh, you know, everybody was just there, man, trying to really help each other make it. And if somebody got a break, if they got called up, we were the first person to hug each other, give, you know, congratulate them. You know, I mean, Mickey James was there when I first got there. You know, I knew Mickey James from the TNA days. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just, um, it was a good, it was a good group, man. Everybody was just there to help each other and cheer each other on. If somebody got a break, we were happy for them. And, you know, we kind of knew that our opportunity would come, you know, so. And uh, can't say enough about Danny Davis and Al Snow and those guys. I mean, you know, they made it in the wrestling business. They didn't have to waste their time or spend their time, you know, trying to help us, you know, snotty those brats, trying to make it in the business and put up with us. But they did, you know. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Um, but, um, <clears throat> but, yeah, we had a good time at OVW. We were really, did, like I said, it was a learning experience. We had a lot of guys, like I said, Dr. Death, Robert Gibson, Al Snow, Danny Davis. Um, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, we had a lot of guys that, that would come back and visit. You know, Doug Basham. Um, you know, Big Show would come. Uh, Lost him. The Six Flags there, you know, in Richmond, or not Richmond, I'm sorry, in Louisville. Um, so we just had a good group, man. And, um, we enjoyed TV every week when, you know, Al and Danny kind of gave us uh, some freedom as far as creativity, um, as far as what we wanted to do in the ring. Um, you know, Paul Burchill, Caitlin, I mean, you know, again, people just trying to think of people, you know, in OBW. Um, so we had a lot of people, you know, necessarily not maybe, you know, not got to the level of like a Cena or Orton or see a punk, but we had a lot of people, you know, who came through and, you know, can say that at one point in their life, they were WWE superstars, you know? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. What, so, was the plan always for you, or maybe it was too early, were they going to bring you up as Jacob Duncan, or was there... Was that, what was there doing? was kind of, there was, well, oddly enough, there was kind of a mixed uh, emotion on that. I think a lot of the creative writers liked the Jacob Duncan character. Mm -hmm. 
But if you remember, um, at that time, I guess Vince was more so going towards, I, I don't know, I felt like a more of an MMA style, you know, wrestling, mm-hmm. which, you know, I'm, obviously I'm not going to argue with Vince McMahon because he created wrestling a lot, you know, in so many ways, but I, did, I necessarily, didn't necessarily didn't agree with because if I felt if I wanted to watch MMA, I'm going to watch MMA. If I want to watch pro wrestling, I want to see characters, you know what I mean? Uh, that's what always separated WWF at the time growing up for me was the characters, mm-hmm. you know, versus like NWA, things like that. So I felt like Jacob Duncan was a character. Um, but, you know, when I went up there and did dark matches and things like that, he did not want me to wear the mask or anything like that. He wanted me to be more just kind of a wrestler, you know, and um, black trunks. And, you know, that's when MMA, you know, was kind of getting big, so to speak. Um, so I felt like I was kind of in the middle there. Like, I felt like Jack, Jacob Duncan could have been a great character for WWE. Um, you know, I kind of look at it like, you know, I felt like it was kind of jealous of what Bray Wyatt did. I felt like Jake, <laughs> I was about Jacob to mention Duncan, that, Jacob yeah. Duncan, I felt like Jacob Duncan could have been a cross, mm-hmm. kind of in between or kind of fit in with the Wyatt family. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I kind of felt jealous about that, but, you know. Life happens for a reason, so, you know, I am where I am for a reason. I've been blessed, you know, since, you know, kind of retiring from wrestling in 08. I've been doing medical sales, so I've been blessed, man. I can't complain. You know, I got to see a lot of the place of the world I never would have saw without pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. Met a lot of great people. You know, I've got some good friends I still communicate with, but, you know, the Jacob Duncan character I felt like was kind of a cross. He could have fit in kind of with, the Wyatt family, maybe, oh, yeah. obviously I was there, kind of there before, a few years before the Wyatt family, but it was kind of, it was kind of that type of character, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, for sure. You still have the mask? I do not, brother. I had a fan offer me 1500 bucks for the mask. Why? I am. So. <laughs> wow! I yeah. yeah, absolutely! <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, oddly enough, I got a hold of the guy I called Abyss when I started thinking about the character. I was like, dude, who made your mask? And I never could have get a hold of his guy. So I did research and I talked to Glenn of Kane. And uh, I actually got a hold of the guy who made Kane's mask. And um, he sent me a bunch of stuff and I took measurements and things like that. Um, and he made the mask for me. I kind of told him the character I wanted and, you know, he made the mask for me. And I got it in the mail. And, um, yeah, you know, he tried. I remember I had to borrow twelve hundred dollars from my dad <laughs> to get the mask made. So, and then I had a fan offer me, you know, if I would sign it and blah blah blah, he gave me fifteen hundred bucks for it. So, I do not have the mask anymore. Well, no, there's I do a not. there's a lot of OVW stuff like that. Those fans were diehard. I don't I don't know if the guy was from like Louisville area, but there's a lot of memorabilia. I think. We there a guy that bought the original OVW belt uh, reached out to us. He's like, I want to show you something, and he, he sent me a picture. And he's he said he's had people offer money, but he said he paid over ten thousand dollars for it. And he's just like, it was nothing. Oh, wow. It was like, ah. <laughs> well, I guess I, I wish crazy. I could just yeah. throw away ten grand. Ten grand on a on a belt. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, I do remember, man. I mean, I, I don't remember if this guy was from Mississippi or Alabama, but he said he used to watch OVW on his computer, like, I guess, oh, that's you know, cool. via some stream. Mm-hmm. And uh, he always, you know, I'm grateful. He always enjoyed the Jacob Duncan character. And, you know, he was like, well, I never understood why Vince didn't do this or that. And I'm like, well, me either, dude. <laughs> 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 but, uh, <laughs> um, but he's like, do you have the mask? And I was like, I do, man. I said, he goes, how much did you pay for it? And I told him, he said, well, I'll give you 1500 for it if you'll sign it for me. And, you know, if I'm not mistaken, he was from Mississippi. And he watched OVW Weekly on his laptop. That's and, awesome. And uh, he was a big fan. So, cool. you know, OVW has a broad stream, and yeah. especially for hardcore wrestling fans. And I remember I told Danny Davis when I became OVW champion, man. I said, dude, I appreciate it, man. I said, I know this... You know, this belt holds a lot of tradition. You know, you, you think about the guys now who are, maybe they're not there now, but they will one day be in the Hall of Fame who've held that belt. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, it's a pretty big honor for them to uh, give you that belt and, um, you know, travel that 
territory, you know, as OVW champion. So, for sure, absolutely. So, if there was any type of advice you can give to anybody coming up in the wrestling business, what would it be? Uh, I mean, just to be honest, I mean, I played, like I said, basketball my whole life, college, overseas. Pro wrestling is by far the hardest sport I've ever done. You know, there's no off season. You're going to work hurt. Um, you know, WWE, TNA, AEW, that's kind of the gold standard, but it's going to, you have to work your balls off to get there. Mm-hmm. And there's nobody going to feel sorry for you. And there's only so much TV time, so don't get me wrong, it is the entertainment business and people are going to try to cut your throat on the way up. So, but stay positive. I remember when I was in TNA, Jimmy Hart, Mouth of the South, I was there for some promotional stuff with him. And um, he's like, man, we'll go to Tampa, do some promotional stuff. I was, I was like, all right, man. He's like, we're going to stop by the Hulkster's house. So I was like, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, man, we stopped by Hulk Hogan's house and we just pulled in the driveway. <clears throat> That was right whenever his reality show was getting ready to take off. Mm-hmm. And uh, his daughter, Brooke, was just starting her music career, things like that. And I've still got the picture in my dining room in his house. <laughs> and uh, that's probably the, one of the biggest things I got from the whole COVID. He goes, man, you're going to have these guys in the locker room who are not, unhappy. He's like, they're going to just complain about how they're not getting a break. They're not getting TV time. They're not doing this. He's like... You have to separate yourself from those guys because that is contagious. He's like, you don't want to be caught up in that. He goes, even if you feel like you're not getting your break, you're not getting your time, put your work in and you will, but don't get caught up in that circle of negativity because it is contagious. And that's one thing I always try to do because no matter what locker room you're in, whether it's Independence, TNA, OBW, WWE, there are those guys, man, who are down and out. They've been there. They're not getting their break. They're frustrated, things like that. But don't get caught up in that. Keep your head up, chin up. You'll get your break, and when you do, you got to be ready for it, you know? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, I want to say thank you for coming on here today, taking time out of your busy day. Um, I know you're going to go watch your son practice football, so um, we will leave it at that. We do appreciate um, all the um, knowledge and uh, stories that you gave us today, and um, just want to say thank you. I'd like to thank, thank you, you guys. You know, we grew up. Go ahead. I'm sorry, man. No, you're Go ahead, fine. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I just you. We grew up watching you. You know, and uh, I appreciate everything you did for wrestling. And I remember being at the Davis Arena, and you, you know, I was younger and smaller, and you were gigantic, and I run around <laughs> with that damn mask, and I, that phoenix, and I, uh, those are very fond memories for me. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you guys, man, for having me. If I can ever do anything else for you, man, let me know. I'm like most parents right now. My boy's 10 years old, so I'm going to go over here and watch the next Tom Brady in the future, if you know what I'm saying. Yes, sir. He's going to practice, and then, you know, 15 years from now, I'll be like every other little league parent. You know, my son's the next LeBron or Tom Brady, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. But, Hey everybody, it's Morty. It's Brian. And thank you for watching today's episode of Developmentally Speaking. If you could, please click that subscribe button. And don't forget to punch that bell icon so you can get notified whenever we go live or drop a new video every Monday. Well, thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you on the next Developmentally Speaking.